Great to see you this morning. Thank you so much for being here. I want to reiterate one of the announcements Pastor Will made this Friday night, the Dreamies. It's going to be an incredible time with everyone that's a part of our Dream Team. So everyone who volunteers, we'd love for you to come out this Friday night. It's going to have a great, great time. This is going to be one of those evenings that if you miss it, you're going to hear other people talking about it, and then you're going to regret missing it. So don't, don't put yourself in that category. Just make plans to be here this Friday night. Going to be a lot of fun. Speaking of our dream team, I want to highlight two of the teams that do just an outstanding, outstanding job. Our parking team and our greeting team. Those, those folks do such a wonderful, wonderful job. <clears throat> You know, they, they, set, they set a high bar as soon as people come on the property or as soon as people come into the building. Almost all of the testimonies we get start with the moment I pulled in the parking lot and the first parking lot attendant waved to me or as soon as I walked in the building and I felt so loved. Th those people set up the testimonies long before folks end up at an altar. They're already being ministered to by the love of God by, by those folks. So if you're a part of one of those teams, thank you so much for what you do. What you do is incredibly incredibly important. And today is the last Sunday of winter. Next Sunday when you're here, when you're here, it'll be officially springtime, which really means nothing for us as far as weather goes. It could be a, you know, a foot of snow, but it does, it does give us a little bit of hope. So those people, you know, a lot of the greeters will stand outside and open up doors. Of course, our parking lot team is out there in the parking lot, you know, in the snow and wind and all that kind of stuff. So you guys have done a great job all winter long. And so you guys will be the first ones to get sun shine and get to enjoy that when the weather gets nice. But thank you for all that, all that you guys do. Well, we started a series about four or five weeks ago that we're calling Relationship SOS. The SOS stands for Song of Solomon because that's the book of the Bible that we've been studying. But it also stands for Save Our Ship in the distress cry that people will put out when they're out at sea and things are going wrong. And the ship that we're really interested in making sure is safe and secure is our relationships, right? So we've been following along with this couple in the book of Song of Solomon, and we've been seeing them at different phases of their relationships as they work through different things. We started off in that first week looking at attraction. We've talked about different things that go on in dating. We looked at the wedding night and the, how they began that physical intimacy. We've talked about conflict last week, but all of those things that we've looked at really aren't the goal that we're after long term. Attraction is important. We need to handle that biblically and do a good job when it comes to attraction. Dating is a very, <clears throat> a very important phase of life. We need to do a good job with that. Intimacy, resolving conflict, all of those are areas where we want to honor God, but none of them are really the goal. You don't want to just be successfully attracted to someone, right? You don't want to just have a great dating life. The goal is to have long-lasting, healthy, strong, mutually enjoyable, passionate, God-honoring relationships. That, that is the ultimate goal. We don't want to stop at any of these phases along the line. We want to have long-lasting, healthy relationships. So today we're going to work our way through the last couple of chapters of Song of Solomon. So we'll reach the end of that book today. And as we look at these last couple chapters, really encourage you to take notes. We're going to look at some different principles, several different keys that are parts of people enjoying long-lasting relationships. So, some key principles of what it takes in, in a relationship to have those kind of long-lasting relationships that we're after. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open to Song of Solomon, chapter 7. <clears throat> Song of Solomon, chapter 7. We'll start reading in verse 1. Now, as we've worked our, our way through this, it's poetry, and there's a lot of options as far as people approaching it and trying to gain an understanding because of its poetic, poetic nature. But what a lot of people believe is that as we work our way through this song, which it's a song that Solomon wrote, you remember that, he wrote 1,005 songs, the Bible says, and this is his song of songs, or the best song that he ever wrote, and it plays out like more like a musical than a traditional song as we would think of it, more like a play, so we're seeing different acts or different parts. And a lot of people believe that we're seeing sort of slices of life along the way. We saw attraction, we saw dating, we saw the, the marriage night, we saw 
brought conflict. And now in these last couple of chapters, what we're looking at is just not, it's not a few days after the wedding. This is actually later years in their marriage. This is on down the road a little ways, which that understanding makes sense since the wedding is right in the middle of the book. And we're seeing kind of both, both ends of the spectrum, how things began and what life looked like in their later years. So chapter 7, verse 1 the man is speaking to his wife, and he says, How beautiful your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. Your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of a craftsman's hands. We'll keep reading, but what's happening is he is once again describing his wife. This time it's going to be a little bit different than when we've seen him describe her before. This time, instead of starting at the head and working his way down, he's starting at her feet and working his way up. If you remember last time on the wedding night when he started at her head and started describing each part, working his way down, he sort of got right around in the midsection and got distracted for some reason and never finished describing her the rest of the way. He got caught up in doing something else, I guess. We, we don't know. But he didn't finish describing her all the way. This time, he's starting at her feet, and he's going to work all the way to the top of her head. Which, remember, this is, this is poetry, so there's symbolism going on here. Here they are later on in life, and his description of her is more full and more complete than ever before. What does that mean? That as they've gone through the years, their love has grown more complete. Their love has grown stronger and more full. It hasn't waned over the years. It's intensified and grown stronger. In fact, now later on in life, there are things that he appreciates about her that he didn't appreciate early on. There's things that he notices about her. There's things that they see in one another that before they were oblivious, but now they've learned to appreciate those things. As they've moved on in their marriage, they've grown stronger and more in love, not weakened over time. Verse 2, he continues to describe her. He's described her feet. He's described her legs. Verse 2, your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Now remember, again, this is poetry. A lot of things that we can learn from it. But guys, we also have to be careful about what exactly we decide to quote to our wives, right? So he's describing her part by part and he gets up to her stomach. If you should ever feel the need to describe your wife's stomach region, some translations say belly, I wouldn't recommend, I'm not an expert on this by any means, but I wouldn't recommend using the words that he chooses to use. He uses words like round and mound. Now, maybe your wife's different than mine, but I, my wife would not appreciate me describing her belly as either round or a mound. Apparently, it worked for him. Maybe at that point, you could say, hey, I like your big round belly. It looks nice to me. And that, I mean, that was, that was sweet talking. Your stomach reminds me of a mound. It's, it's just like a big... Looks like a pitcher's mound when you lay on your back. I, I, I really like that about you, how, how round and moundy you are. So that's up to you. You can decide what kind of language you're going to use. But one of the things we're seeing here is something we've seen earlier on. As time goes by, culture will have a different idea of what is beautiful, what is handsome, physically speaking. We, we talked about how she was talking how her skin was too dark. She wasn't fair complexioned enough, and so she didn't even want to be looked at. They used to think fair skin was nice. Now most people think tan skin is nice. Apparently back then you could compliment how round a woman's belly was, and that was, that was a nice thing. Now our culture gives us a different idea of what is attractive. Now a woman is considered attractive if she's six feet tall and weighs about 15 pounds. That's kind of what, that's what we've set aside as, uh, you know, our culture's idea of beauty. But what we can see is that as years go by, people have a different standard of what is beautiful or what is handsome. The styles change, hairstyles, clothing styles, all those kinds of things are constantly changing. So it is a mistake to adopt culture's idea of what is beautiful. And when we understand those kinds of things can change, I understand I don't have to to be a victim or have that dictated to me, I can make up my mind of what is beautiful. You can make up your mind of the standard of beauty and handsome. And for a husband and wife, it is wisdom to decide that your husband, your wife is the standard of beauty, that your wife is the ultimate picture of beautiful. Your husband is what a handsome man looks like. Instead of always being frustrating, cha always chasing a changing target. So that's what we're, that we're seeing here. And he says that your stomach is, is like a round goblin 
goblet of wine. Your stomach is like a mound of wheat. He's using two crops that were the main crops in Israel, grapes and wheat. Those were the two main harvests that they would have. And so he's saying, you fulfill me, you satisfy me. You're like a constant source of satisfaction. And these harvests came at different times. One of these crops was harvested in the springtime and the other in the fall. So he's saying, as time goes by, as seasons come and go, as the seasons change, I continually find you a, a source of satisfaction and fulfillment. You are always just right for me. Couples that last and are continually happy, long-lasting, healthy relationships are made up of people that aren't always dissatisfied with their spouse, but they look at their spouse and they find reason to be satisfied. Even as things change and the years go by, they see their spouse as a constant source of satisfaction. Verse 3. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, so the same kind of language he's used in the past. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are like the pools of Heshbon by the gate of bath Rabim. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon looking toward Damascus. Again, you've got to use some wisdom, <laughs> some wisdom in what you choose to, to sweet talk your lady with. A nose like a tower doesn't work for everyone. But he says, your eyes are like the pools of Heshbon. Now, Heshbon were these pools that were known for having water that was just crystal clear, always pure. These beautiful, clear pools of water. And he says, when I look at you, your eyes are like these pools of Heshbon. Now, the pools of Heshbon had such clear water because they were spring-fed. And people had gone and sort of dug out all of the debris and all of the sediment and all of the soil and all that kind of stuff and got it down to where it was just stone. It was just a, a rock pool, almost like a bowl made out of stone. And so it would be spring-fed and there was, there was no dirt or anything to murk up or cloud the water. The water that we have around here, a pond or a stream, even when it looks clear, if you were to step into it, what happens? All the, the dirt and stuff that's at the bottom gets stirred up, and so as soon as you step into it, what was clear becomes clouded and mucked up, and you've got to wait a little while for that sediment to kind of fall back to the bottom. But if you would move again, the same thing would happen, and you just keep stirring up the same sediment over and over. He says, I look at you, and everything is clear. Everything is pure. There, there, there's nothing cloudy or murky there's no issues. I look at you and everything, it's like the pools of Heshbon. How did this husband and wife get to that point where there, were, there was nothing to be stirred up? There was nothing negative to cloud the relationship. Well, very similar, apparently, to how these people created the pools of Heshbon. Everything that needed to be removed was dealt with and removed. All the sediment, all the dirt, all the things, they, they got them and they got them out of the way so there was no danger of it being continually stirred up over and over and over again. Last week we said, that healthy couples, healthy relationships, they're not void of conflict. People just learn how to properly deal with the conflict that's inevitable in a relationship. So what most people do when conflict comes, they'll experience it for a little while and then it'll kind of die down. But what's happening is it's just kind of falling down. Things seem pure and clear for a little while. But the next time someone brings up a certain subject, the next time someone makes a wrong move, that, that argument gets stirred up and people end up dealing with the same thing things over and over and over again. You take a step and man, we're dealing with that same issue. And people reserve your past failure. You reserve that misstep the person had. And it's always in the back pocket. You're ready to play that card. And round and round you go the same cycle over and over and over again. Not this couple though, because when they dealt with it, when something got stirred up, they dealt with it and it was removed, never to be dealt with again. In healthy relationships, when conflict arise, it arises, it is dealt with forgiveness is extended and they move on once it's forgiven we're not dealing with that anymore I forgave you you forgave me we've dealt with that it's not going to get stirred up again and it's removed forgiveness is absolutely key in long-lasting healthy relationships you need to walk in forgiveness. You need to extend mercy. You need to walk in grace, just like God has forgiven us. That's the standard we're given biblically for the kind of forgiveness that we extend one another, and it certainly applies in the marriage covenant. So he describes her, we'll keep reading. Verse 5, your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. 
Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. How beautiful you are and how pleasing, O love, with your delight. So he's worked his way from her feet all the way up to the top of her head, describing her, but he's not quite done talking about her body just yet. Verse 7, your stature is like that of the palm and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruits. May your breasts be like the clusters of the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples. Now, what I think he's saying here probably doesn't need a whole lot of of explanation, what he's got on his mind. Kind of uh, alluding to some things, not very veiled, pretty, pretty apparent what he's got on his mind. She's like a palm tree. Her breasts are like the fruit. He wants to climb climb the tree and get his hands uh, on, on the fruit, right? I don't know if you've ever climbed a palm tree, and I'm not talking about the way he's talking about climbing. I mean a literal, a literal palm tree, if you've ever climbed a palm tree. I haven't, but I did some reading about how to climb a palm tree, and apparently there's more than one way to climb one. One of the options is to get some kind of belt and put around the tree and put spikes on your shoes or on your feet, and you can kind of work your way up with that belt and use those spikes and, and almost make it like you're walking up a ladder, and it, it seems to be very, very easy. You can just work your way up that, up that tree. But if you were to go home and to search online about this method of climbing a tree, you'll find find people are very much against it because of the damage that it does to the tree. In one article I read, it called it palm tree abuse. One guy said it was like giving the palm tree multiple stab wounds, which I I guess in a sense is basically what is happening, that you're puncturing that tree over and over and over again. And the problem is once it's been treated like that, it's more susceptible to disease. You can hinder the growth of the tree. In some cases, the tree even, even will die as a result of it. Now, there's another method for climbing a palm tree that is more traditional. Maybe you've seen people on TV or a movie climb a palm tree like this, or if you've been someplace tropical, maybe you've seen someone go up a palm tree where they're not using any apparatus. They're just using their their hands and their legs, and they go up to the tree, kind of wrap themselves around it, and they'll shimmy up the tree, which I would assume requires a certain level of skill to go up a, a tree like that. Now, what method you choose to climb the tree really is dependent on how you feel about the tree itself. Because one method is is much easier than the other. You just walk up the tree like you're going up a ladder, but you're going to damage the tree. One requires a lot of skill, but you're going to preserve it. So what what method you use, it really just depends on how you feel about the tree, not at the fruit that you're after. Is that all you care about, or do you also care about the tree that's providing that fruit? So let's say you had a palm tree in the backyard that was your prized palm tree. You loved that palm tree every year you enjoyed its fruit. If you really care about that tree itself, you're probably going to develop whatever skill necessary to climb that tree so that you don't damage it. Why? Because you don't just care about the harvest. You don't just care about what you're going to glean from the tree. You care about the tree itself. The same thing is true in relationships. In healthy, long-lasting relationships, people care about the other person more than they care about what that person is able to provide for them. Now, obviously, there is a, a sexual element being referenced here, but this principle applies all the way across the board in the relationship, that we've got to care not just about what that person is able to provide me, what I benefit from this relationship, We need to focus on actually caring for the person themselves. Because just like this palm tree, the damage that can occur if we go about it the wrong way, the same things apply in a relationship. That palm tree, if it's climbed in a way that all you care is about the fruit, then you can make it susceptible to disease. Relationships can become incredibly unhealthy when there's that sense of manipulation and all I care about, all you care about is what you can benefit and you don't really care about the person. Relationships become very unhealthy. You can stunt the growth of a tree by climbing it the wrong way. Same thing in a relationship. You will stunt the growth of it. You can kill a tree by going about it in a way where all you care is about the fruit. Same thing in a relationship. You can kill a relationship. You can kill a marriage when one person only cares about what they're able to get from it instead of actually caring about the person themselves. So he describes her from her feet clear up to the top of her head, 
Then he tells her what he has on his mind, what he would like to see happen next. And the next section of verses is the woman responding to what he's had to say. He, he tells her, I see you like a palm tree with fruit. Let's her know what, what his intentions are. And when she begins to respond, her response is positive. She responds in a good way. She doesn't say, boy, you've got a one-track mind. She doesn't say, what a pig you are. She doesn't say, oh, this is typical. You're just such a man. She doesn't say any of those things that would make him feel ashamed or embarrassed. It is natural for a man to desire his wife physically. That's the way we're designed. She doesn't make him feel silly or embarrassed. She responds in a positive way. We'll skip ahead a few verses to chapter 8, verse 1. But this is her continuing to respond to what he has requested. Verse 1 of chapter 8, she says, says, if only you were to me like a brother who was nursed at my mother's breasts, then if I found, found you outside, I would kiss you and no one would despise me. Now, when she says, I wish you were my brother that nursed at my mother's breasts, she's not getting weird on us or anything. There's a reason she's saying what she's saying. In that culture, husbands and wives weren't supposed to show any affection to one another out in public, out in open. That was taboo in that culture. But if someone was your direct family member, then you could hug them and kiss them, and that was perfectly acceptable. So we don't know what the context of this conversation is. Maybe they're out <clears throat> in public. Maybe the they're at the market or walking around town. Maybe what we're reading, he's whispering in her ear. He's sweet-talking her. And they're out in public, and she says, listen, I, I wish you were my brother because I don't want to wait until we get home. I can't keep my hands off you. I want to hug you. I want to kiss you right here. I don't want to wait until we get home. She has a passionate, positive response to his request. That is one of the... the, the natures of a healthy, strong relationship, it's not one-sided. Both, both members of the couple are passionate and have a desire for one another. And we'll look back a few verses and see some of the principles that set them up for having this kind of relationship. So that, let's back up a couple of verses to chapter 7, verse 11. This is the woman still responding. Again, we're looking for some key elements or principles that set them up to be able to have this kind of passionate relationship. She says in verse 11, Come, my lover, let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Come, my lover, let, let's just get away. Let's spend some time together. Let's go out to a village. Let's go get a, a bed and breakfast for the night. Let's take a little trip. Let's go on a drive. They're spending time with one another. Relationships that flourish don't just flourish because the stars aligned and everything just happened to work out right. They require an investment, and one of the key investments that you have to make in a relationship for it to thrive is the investment of time. Just like it's foolish to go to an account that you've never put anything Thing in and expect to make a withdrawal. It's, it, it's foolishness to think that you can make withdrawals and expect passion in a relationship when you have failed to invest the time necessary to see that relationship flourish. You need to invest time. Invest time in your relationship. Have a date night. Go away every once in a while for a, a weekend. Stay up late after the kids are in bed just to sit and talk or play a game or have something that you share in common that you can enjoy with one another, that you're continuing to develop that friendship, that you spend time with one another, not just showing up in bed and expecting everything to play out the way that you hope. Relationships require an investment of time. We'll see in the next couple of verses that a continuation of this principle that relationships, for them to flourish, they require an investment. Let's skip down to verse 13. Verse 13, she says this, The mandrakes send out their fragrance, and at our door is every delicacy, both new and old, that I have stored up for you, my lover. The mandrakes send out their fragrance. Now, it was believed that the scent of a mandrake was like an aphrodisiac, that just the aroma of it would start to, to put people in the mood and start moving them towards physical intimacy. So sort of ancient aromatherapy, these mandrakes. Now, most guys, you might be thinking, can I get a mandrake-scented candle? Can I get mandrake-scented cologne? Can I get mandrake-scented anything? Unfortunately, the answer seems to be no, at least according to my search on Amazon, because I thought the same thing. <laughs> I've already looked. I couldn't find anything. But if you're able to find something, that you should be willing to share with the rest of us, the rest of us guys. But they, they've put out mandrakes 
whether it's true or not, they're putting in the, the effort to set the stage, to set themselves up for success, that they know where they want to end up and they're going to pave the way and take the necessary steps to get them there. Now, again, obviously we're talking about physical intimacy here, but you can apply these principles to any part of a relationship. You know where you want to end up. Here's the kind of relationship I want. Here's where I want to be down the road. Here's where I want to be tonight, whatever the case may be. And you don't just hope for it. You don't just wish for it. You've got to make the investment, take the steps. What is it going to take for me to get at that destination? And put in the time, put in the effort. They're slicing mandrakes. They're putting delicacies outside the door, whatever those are. They're setting the stage so that they can succeed. Relationships require, for them to thrive, they require an investment of time and energy. Most people are too lazy or too selfish to make that investment. And so they just feel like they're missing out and look at other people's relationships with jealousy and envy. You could have the same thing if you would do what someone else is doing to bring about those results. One of the things that happens is people become envious, jealous of someone else's marriage, someone else's husband, someone else's wife. People will say or think things along the saying, the grass is greener on the other side. You'll see what they're enjoying and the grass, it just, it seems like things are better over there. Well, oftentimes the grass isn't greener. It just seems like it's greener. It's very easy to romanticize about things where you only have limited information. You, you can paint the picture however you want. And so you romanticize about it, but you don't know the whole story. But sometimes the grass really is greener. And in those cases, when the grass is greener, it's probably because they're simply taking better care of the grass on the other side of the fence. My neighbor has a much nicer lawn than I do. My lawn is probably an embarrassment to the entire neighborhood, and I say probably just to give myself a little cushion. I know it's an embarrassment to the whole neighborhood. I don't, I don't take good care of my lawn. So I, it would be silly for me to be jealous of my neighbor's lawn. I know that they're putting in more time and more effort to develop the lawn that they have. And if you were to take me and switch lawns, it's just a matter of time. If I had access to that lawn and I was in control of it until it turned brown and dead and full of dandelions like mine. Because when it would be subject to the way I care for it, it would bring about the same results. When you see that husband, when you see that wife, when you see that other marriage and think, oh man, things must have just worked out better for them. And you feel che uh, cheated or shortchanged. More than likely, if you were to be able to step into that marriage and bring your selfish, lazy habits, you'd get the same kind of results that you're getting in your own marriage. That thing would turn into hardness of heart, bitterness, resentment, whatever it is that you, you've nourished in your old relationship. But people will go from marriage to marriage, relationship to relationship, or just be miserable in their own relationship, not realizing that what they are enjoying or not enjoying is directly the result of the work that they're putting in or failing to put in. It requires work. If you want a thriving relationship, if you want to flourish down the road like this couple, where things are still good into their 50s, their 60s, their 70s, their 80s, things are wonderful. It's not going to just happen. You're going to have to work at it. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3 to put on love, talking about it like it was a garment or a, an outfit, to put it on. Now, he's talking about brotherly love, Christian love that we, we can apply all over the place, but those principles still apply to the love found in a marriage relationship. He compares it to putting on a garment. Nobody here this morning accidentally ended up in the clothes that you're in right now. You got up, you decided what you were going to wear, and you very intentionally dressed yourself in those clothes, right? There's no accident about it. And he's saying that's the way that love works. We've bought into an idea in our culture that if it's really love, it's just going to accidentally happen. And it's always, oh, the next thing I knew, this was happening. No, if you want to have a thriving relationship, just like putting on an outfit or a garment, you've got to be intentional about it and not be lazy. Take the necessary steps to end up where you want to end up. So she responds, she responds in a positive way. We'll keep reading chapter 8, verse 5. It says, who is this coming up from the desert, leaning on her lover? Who is this coming up from the desert, leaning on her lover? Now, when we use the word desert, talking about situations or circumstances, even today, that's usually not a good thing. 
If someone told you, I'm just kind of going through a desert season, they're probably not trying to tell you that everything is wonderful, right? That it's a trying time. It's a difficult time. So that's certainly true when it comes to poetry, which this is. Even more so when we're talking about Jewish poetry or poetry in ancient Israel, when the idea of traveling through a wilderness or a desert would conjure up in their minds the idea of the children of Israel going through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. So she, they say, who is coming up from the desert leaning on her lover? Who is coming up out of this desert time, this trying time, this difficult time? This couple has gone through some hard times. We saw way back in chapter one, they've had to deal with her self-image issues. Remember, she said, my skin is so dark, I don't, I don't even want anyone to look at me. They'd had to navigate that. They had to work through the, the difficulties of staying pure and honoring God through a dating relationship and through that phase. Talked about not awakening love until it pleases. That, that was something they repeated over and over. Let's not stir things up. Let's make sure we honor God. They talked about catching the little foxes that spoil the potential that God had given them in their relationship. You know why they're talking about catching little foxes? Because they were aware that there were little foxes that needed to be dealt with. They get into marriage and they're dealing with conflict. Last week we read about her locking them out of the bedroom him punching a hole through the wall. They've had to deal with some stuff. And here they are coming out of trial, coming out of difficulties, coming out of some of the hardships of dealing and working through a relationship. And it says that she's leaning on him. Now the image isn't her staggering along because of the difficulties, now she can barely make it. The idea of that word in the Hebrew is that they have learned to support one another. They've learned to rely on one another. Coming through hardship, what could have driven them further apart, what could have caused them to turn on one another, has actually resulted in them turning towards one another. Now they know, here's where I can rely on you. Here's where you can rely on me. And he is supporting her. They're stronger as a result of their trials instead of being weaker. Verse 6, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as jealous as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. Now this idea of a seal, it's almost like the idea of a, a stamp or sometimes when they would have a signet ring and, and put that impression on things. It was a mark of ownership, almost like when they would brand cattle. And you'd be able to tell whose cow it was because of the emblem or the logo, the mark that was put on it. Whose cow is this? Well, I can see the, the emblem, the mark on it, the seal. I know that one belongs to me. Well, I can see the seal on that one. I know that one belongs to you. So it's this idea of ownership, which in a relationship causes people in our culture to bristle a little bit and push back at this idea of ownership like property. But that is a principle that you see in this, in this story of this man and woman that lasting relationships are possessive. You see it over and over through this, through this book of the Bible. Them saying things like, I am my lover's and he is mine, or I am my beloved's and she is mine. That's the idea of possession, of, of belonging to one another. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul writes of husbands and wives that a husband's body doesn't even belong to himself anymore. It belongs to his wife. And a wife's body isn't hers anymore. It belongs to her husband. Now, we can push back against that, and people don't like hearing that, but that is a principle in long-lasting, strong, healthy, God-honoring relationships. And the idea of possession <clears throat> is not, not to be able to manipulate or be hard on the other person, but quite the opposite. When something truly belongs to you, you're supposed to take better care of it than if it belonged to someone else or if you were just borrowing it or if it was just temporary, right? Have you ever rented a car before? I've rented cars numbers of times. Of all the cars that I've rented, I've never checked the oil once. I've never taken it in for a tune-up. I've never washed the thing. I drive them hard. I drive them carelessly. I take them back at the end of the weekend, and I never see them again. I don't care about them. But when it's my own car, when it belongs to me, I'm going to care for it better, right? I do have the oil changed. I do wash it on occasion. I do have it tuned up every now and then. Why? Because that, that is my car. When we take that idea and carry it into marriage, instead of 
of people just being throwaway, temporary. If things work out fine, if not, I'll just move on to someone else. That damage is a relationship. When you put that line up that you're your own and I'm my own, you're failing to see what happens in the marriage covenant. The ownership is exchanged. I belong to my wife and my wife belongs to me. Now, if I, I understand that properly, it's going to change the way I treat her in a good way. When I know that that, that is my wife, that's the wife that I get. So the way I treat her now, I'm going to either reap the benefits of it down the road or I'm going to pay the consequences. If I'm hard on her and if I'm demeaning, well, I'm going to see the evidence of that five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 30 years down the road. When I understand she is mine and not just someone I'm borrowing and I'll move on to someone else. Lasting love has a possessive quality to it. We'll keep reading. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy, unyielding as the grave. For love is as strong as death, jealousy, unyielding as the grave. Lasting love is possessive, and lasting love carries the idea of permanency. There is a permanency to it. You treat the family china differently than you treat a paper plate. One, you use and then you toss it aside. The other, you treat with care because you know this is supposed to last. I want to make it last. You can apply this to almost anything else that you own, but you should also apply it in the marriage covenant. There should be a sense of permanence in that relationship. So many people miss out on this benefit in the relationship. The benefit that that kind of commitment brings to a marriage. The idea of permanency. We're not just trying this thing out. We're not taking it for a spin. We're not seeing how things go for a little while. This thing is permanent. You can see the impact it has when you apply it to other relationships. If I applied a temporary mindset, if things work out okay, under these conditions, I'll continue to be married to you. If I applied that same kind of attitude in my relationship with my kids, it would be damaging to them. It would hinder them, it would hinder their development, and it would hinder my relationship. If I told my children, listen, I'll be your dad as long as things work out okay, as long as it's pleasing to me, as long as you don't cross any of these lines or do anything too bad, then, you know, then we're going to have to readdress it. I'll probably go get some other kids. What, what would that do to a child growing up? that they would fail to develop properly in that relationship environment. But when they know I am your dad and I'll never, ever stop being your dad, there's nothing you could ever do to make me stop wanting to be your dad. I'll always love you. There's no line. There's no line that exists that my kids could cross and I would say I'm done with you. They could burn my house down. They could destroy every possession I have. And my love wouldn't fade for them in the least. I'd still want to be their dad. I'd still want what's best for them. We understand it in some of those family relationships, but when it comes to a husband and wife, all of a sudden the permanency and the commitment level comes way Way down and there's more of a temporary nature and we put parameters on it people are afraid of commitment they'll enter marriage which with a bunch of pre-made agreements when this doesn't work out here's how we're gonna split up the stuff they go into it already with a backup plan that will keep you from flourishing in your marriage you've got to be all in he goes on to say it burns like blazing fire like a mighty flame he's talking about the love they have it's like a fire it's all-consuming once I'm in this thing, I am all in. I don't have my hand on the escape hatch, just waiting for one wrong move, playing it safe, kind of halfway committing. I'm, I'm all in. Just like a child will come, will suffer the consequences of having a parent that's halfway committed, your husband or your wife will suffer the same thing. Your marriage will suffer from a half-hearted commitment. Verse 7, many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. What she's saying, it doesn't matter what comes against our marriage. It doesn't matter what comes against us. Whatever trial, whatever difficulty, nothing is going to cause me to go away. I'm in this all the way. If one were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly scorned. So they're talking about this incredible love. It'll, it'll never stop. It'll never give up. It'll always keep going. You can always count on it. There's nothing that will ever hinder my love for you. And then says, if, if one were to give everything they have for this love, it would be scorned. They're describing the kind of love that all of us desire. Every one of us want to be loved the way this is talking about being loved. A love that will never, ever, ever fade. No conditions, no strings attached. Somebody being that committed, that, that in love with us. 
that desires ownership. That level of love is what we desire. This is well, how, how do you get that kind of love? How do we acquire that? That's what we want. That's what we desire. How do I get there? How do I get to enjoy that kind of relationship? He says, you can't, you can't buy it. If you were to try to buy it, all the money in the world, it's going to be scorned. It's going to be scoffed at. You can't buy this kind of love. Well, then how do we get it? Because we want it. There's a principle that you see in the book of Proverbs when it comes to relationships. You see it applied to friends. You say things like, if you want to be a friend, what are you supposed to, or if you want to have a friend, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to be a friend. I want friendship. What do I do? I extend friendship. How do I get this kind of love? You've got to extend that kind of love. You've got to give that kind of love. I know it makes you vulnerable. That's really the nature of love all the way around, though. You, you make yourself vulnerable. I want that kind of love. I need to express that kind of love. It might take one partner taking the first step. I, I am all, I'm not holding anything back. I'm all in on this thing. You'll, you'll never cross that line. That line doesn't exist. I'm going to scoop out those pools of Heshbon, all the issues that get murked up, the things that I could bring up. I'm setting them aside. You'll never hear about them. We'll never deal with it again. I'm going to forgive you for all the garbage that's ever happened. I want to keep things clean and pure. I am all in on this relationship. I'm not looking for you to make a certain mistake. I don't care about what mistakes you've made in the past. I'm going all in. I'm consumed with this relationship, just like a blazing fire. You can't buy this love. The only way to acquire it is to first extend it. We get to the end of this song, the end of this play, the end of this musical. And this last section of verses is almost like a flashback to give us kind of an, a, a big picture view of how did this couple end up with this relationship that all of us desire that all of us want. How did they get here? We're reading about them later on in life, so, still so in love. Everything they've come through, it's just served to make them more in love and stronger. They've invested in one another. They've got a love for each other that would never fade away. How did they get there? Well, we flash back and they give us some perspective. Verse 10, I'm sorry, verse eight. It says, we have a young sister and her breasts are not yet grown. What shall we do for our sister for the day she is spoken for? If you were here when we started in chapter one, one of the first things that this woman said is that her brothers were hard on her and made her work in the vineyard. Do you remember reading about that? Well, her brothers apparently were sort of in authority over her, maybe helped raise her. We don't know exactly what the scenario was. But now we're flashing back, and it's her brothers speaking now. And they're talking about this woman. She's, she's their, their little sister. And they're saying, listen, our sister's young, but we know it's inevitable. Somewhere down the road, she's going to want to run off with some man. We know how this thing works. She's going to want to be with someone. Some, sooner or later, someone's going to come and ask if they, if they can marry our little sister. She's going to want to have a romantic relationship. That's just the way things work. How are we going to make sure that we handle things right when that day comes? How will we know when she's ready for that kind of relationship? How do we know how, how to guide her and direct her and give her wisdom? What shall we do? for our sister for the day she's spoken for. Verse nine, if she is a wall, we will build towers of silver on her. If she's a door, we will enclose her with panels of cedar. If she is a wall, we're talking about having high standards, keeping herself reserved, being able to restrain herself, being able to put limits on herself. If she's able to keep herself like a wall, to keep herself upright, to keep herself pure, we're going to pile silver on her. We're going to crown her. We're going to bless her. Now, obviously, this, this whole book has had sexual elements all the way through it. So this idea of a wall, they're talking about sexual purity, at least to some extent, that there has not been a penetration. She is a wall. She's kept herself pure. If she'll honor God, if she'll handle herself right and restrain herself, we're going to be free to bless her. But if she is a door... If she's a door, we will enclose her with panels of cedar. If she's a wall, we can bless her. We can turn her loose. But if she hasn't learned to restrain herself, if she's a door, she's boy crazy. People are coming and going all the time. It's one relationship after another. She is a door. Easy come, easy go. Then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to box her in. We're going to have to panel her with cedar. We're going to have to put the restraint on her that she doesn't have the discipline to restrain herself. So we're going to have to hold her back. We're going to have to be strict with her. 
to protect her and set her up for success. Now, in the next verse, she begins to respond. She begins to weigh in on the situation. Verse 10, she says, I am a wall, and my breasts are like towers. Now, she's, she's not bragging about her, her physical body. She's talking about how she has kept herself pure. I am a wall. I did keep my standard high. I did keep myself pure. My breasts are like towers. She's talking about they, 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 she's kept herself out of reach. She's walked in purity. I have honored God. I've walked just the way that his word says I should walk. Look at the results. Thus I have become in his eyes like one bringing contentment. What was the result of her handling her, her love life in a way that honored God? Now I'm positioned uniquely to be someone who brings, I'm a carrier of contentment. That word in the Hebrew is shalom, which literally means peace. I, I minister peace in this relationship. I carry contentment. I carry satisfaction. I carry joy. I carry peace. Verse 11, Solomon had a vineyard in Baal Haman. He let out his vineyard to tenants. Each was to bring forth its fruit, a thousand shekels of silver. But my own vineyard is mine to give. The thousand shekels are for you, O Solomon. And 200 are for those who tend its fruit. Now what a lot of scholars believe is happening here at the end of this song is they're letting us know the background story of how she got in this wonderful relationship. They believe that the vineyard she was made to work in at the beginning of the story was Solomon's vineyard all along. That her brothers were the ones that leased it out. They were the ones that were caring for it, and they made her work in it. And it was her working in that vineyard that resulted in her meeting Solomon, on them beginning to date, on them falling in love, getting married, and enjoying this wonderful relationship. How, how did all of it start? It started back with her being willing to submit to the authority that was over her. She could have said, absolutely not, I'm not going to do it. Or she could have had a poor attitude. But she was told to go work in that vineyard. She submitted, even if she didn't understand at the time. Do you think she could see into the future when they say, hey, get out of bed, it's time to work in the vineyard? Do you think she was able to see that she'd be able to be married to the king? That she'd be able to have this wonderful relationship? That here we are thousands of years later, still reading about her marriage and saying, man, that's what I want. Do you think she could see that? I doubt she could. I doubt she had that kind of foresight to say, you know what, this is how it's going to result. She couldn't see where she'd end up. But in the moment, she was willing to submit. In the moment, she, even though I don't understand it, I'll trust. I'm just going to submit to the authority in my life. Now, there's different applications for us. We talked a couple of weeks ago about parents training their children up in the way they should go, making difficult decisions in the short term to set them up for success later on. We talked about things like going to school, brushing your teeth, taking a bath, things that sometimes kids push back against, but you know it's for their benefit. I don't want to go to school. I don't care you're going to school. Get out of bed. You make them do it. Even though they think you're being mean, you know you're setting them up for success. That we need to apply the same thing when it comes to social relationships and romantic relationships. You're hard on, I don't care, you're no, not going out with him. You're not getting in the car with that boy. I don't care. No, you're not going with those friends. I hate you, Dad. I don't care if you hate me. I'm doing it for your own benefit. Making hard decisions in the short term to set them up for success down the road, to be willing to do that. So we see one element or one application so just submitting to the authority. But there's also an application for the rest of us. Just choosing to submit to the word of God when it comes to our relationships. You don't have to understand it. Just trust it. Just trust the word of God. She trusted what she was told by authority in her life, and it got her to the most blessed, wonderful, romantic, passionate relationship that anyone has ever dreamed of. She just submitted in the short term, and she benefited in the long term. You, you don't have to understand. I don't get sexual purity. That sounds old-fashioned. Saving yourself from marriage, that sounds dumb. You don't have to understand it. Just trust that God wants what's best for you. Submit to the authority of the Word of God, knowing down the road, I'm going to see more clearly. Down the road, I'll understand later on. I don't understand why I should honor my husband, why he's supposed to be the head of the household. I don't understand why I'm supposed to show him respect. You don't have to understand it. Just trust that when God's Word told Told you that's the way you're supposed to operate in the marriage covenant that he has what's best for you in his heart I don't understand why I'm supposed to love my wife like Christ loved the church I know she doesn't deserve to be loved like that I, I don't have to understand why I just need to trust God this is how you told me that this is the best way to be a husband 
I don't see how it's going to get me where I want to be, but I trust you, God. I trust this is the best way to live my life. The last couple of verses. You who dwell in the gardens with friends in attendance, let me hear your voice. Verse 14, this is the woman speaking to her man again. Come away, my lover, and be like a gazelle, like a young stag on the spice-laden mountains. So the last verse, here they are later in life. She's inviting her man to come to the mountains, come to the hills, and once again, it's exactly what you think she's saying. She's inviting him to a time of intimacy. Here they are later on in life, still passionate, still in love. How do they end up there? How do they end up with that kind of relationship? God's ways work. God's ways work. God wants what's best for you. The very thing that you're so hungry for, you feel like you can take shortcuts to get there. That's the enemy, trying, not trying to give you a, a leg up to get there, trying to derail you so you never get there. Follow God's ways when it comes to your relationships. I know that people are in all kinds of different phases when it comes to relationships, and there's all kinds of different situations represented in a group of this many people. People that carry all kinds of wounds, all kinds of hurts, all kinds of background stories, people with different frustrations going on in their, their lives right now, people with all kinds of different hopes, people with all kinds of different fears. There's people in this room that have been hurt, that have been wounded, that have baggage, that it was not even any fault of their own. They're just the victim of somebody else's selfishness, somebody else's laziness. It hurt them and wounded them, and here they are carrying the wound, carrying the embarrassment, carrying the shame of somebody else's mistake that they happen to end up in relationship with. There's some of us here that we've made mistakes in the past and we wish we could go back and change things and do it differently but what's happened has happened and so there's a certain level of shame and guilt and wounds that come along with knowing what you've done to someone else what I've done to someone else and the hurt that we've caused there's people with all kinds of different backgrounds how we've been hurt how we've been abused how we have hurt someone else how we've abused somebody else all kinds of different situations all kinds of different places in our relationship, needing different things. Here's what I need to happen in my relationship. It might be totally different for you. I want to encourage you with one, one last portion of Scripture in a minute. And we're going to pray for wherever you are in your relationship. There's people that need healing, deep healing. There's people that need encouragement. There's people that need wisdom. There's people that need restoration. There's people that need to be woken up to see what they're squandering. People in all different places but everything we need is found in the presence of God. So you can leave here today with whatever healing, whatever encouragement, whatever strengthening it is that you need. Let me read you from Colossians chapter one. It's talking about Jesus, verse 15. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Continues talking about Jesus. Verse 17, he says, and he is before all things and in him all things consist. In Jesus, all things consist. That word consist means held together, to be held together. They consist. So he's talking about everything. He's talking about the planets, the way the planets stay in their orbit instead of just going spinning off out into nowhere, how we stay attached to this planet instead of floating off into space, how molecules and atoms and cells and everything hold together so that things work properly. How, how does all that happen? In Jesus, the presence of Jesus somehow causes all things to consist. Now, it's certainly talking about planets and molecules and all of that, but it's also talking about everything else that is held together properly. How does it stay together properly? In him, in him, all things consist. So we can apply this also to our marriages, to our households, to our children, to our relationships. How, how can I keep this thing together when it seems like it's going to fall apart? How, how can I hold my kids where they need to be and they don't end up going off the rails somewhere? In Jesus, in him, in him. That's where everything holds together. In him, all things consist. So as we handle our relationships, men, as we lead our families, as we lead our households, as we lead our children, as we lead our wives, there, there's only one environment that we're promised. Everything is going to hold together. Everything is going to consist. It's not going to fall apart. And that environment is in Jesus. We've got to keep those relationships, keep ourselves, keep our family in Jesus. In him, all things consist.